In this video, I'm going to illustrate the use of a new procedure that's been added to version 16 of Stack Graphics called correspondence analysis. What correspondence analysis does is it represents tabular data, data that would normally be shown in tabular form, graphically. Graphically so that we can visualize the information in that table in a useful way. Now, the correspondence analysis is going to be useful for any data that can be represented as relative frequencies in a two-way table. The data set we're going to look at comes from the excellent book on correspondence analysis called Correspondence Analysis in Practice by Michael Greenacre. He shows a data set that represents the results of 796 research grant applications. The researchers are divided into 10 scientific disciplines, everything from geology through statistics and mathematics and so forth. The amount of funding they received is indicated by a letter, A, B, C, D, or E. A means the most funding down through E, which means they didn't get any funding at all. Their application was denied. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to see visually which scientific disciplines are similar to each other and which are considerably different. Now the first thing you do when you do a correspondence analysis is you convert those counts into what are called row profiles. Actually, you can do row profiles or column profiles. What a row profile does, though, is show you the distribution of the counts within each row. For example, if you look at geology, you'll see that about 3.5% of the researchers in geology got level A funding. 22.4% level B, and so forth, down to the unlucky 11.8% whose grants were turned down. If we could plot these row profiles in a five-dimensional space, 10 points in a five-dimensional space, we could see which points were close to one another and which points were far away. Well, actually, since they add to one in each of the rows, you could actually plot them in a four-dimensional space. But we don't even know how to plot in four dimensions. What a correspondence analysis does is it takes profiles like this, either row or column profiles or both, and reduces the dimensionality, typically down to either two or three principal dimensions, so that you can, in fact, plot the different disciplines and visualize which are similar to, to uh, which others. I've loaded a file called funding.sgd into the first data sheet in the Stack Graphics data book. This file has the data we were just looking at, plus one additional column and two additional rows. It actually adds a column labeled Y with a very small amount of data, and rows 11 and 12 with counts for two additional scientific disciplines, and in this case, museums and math sciences. Column Y and rows 11 and 12 are going to be used as what are called supplementary columns and rows. These will be data that we want to plot that we won't use in doing any statistical calculations. Now to begin, I'll go to the Describe menu to Multivariate Methods. And the selection I want is the one labeled Correspondence Analysis. Now, on the initial data input dialog box, you'll have a choice of specifying untabulated data or tabulated data. Now, untabulated data, that would be a situation where I had, for example, 796 rows, one for each researcher. And I had a column that indicated their discipline 
and another column that indicated their level of funding. I could ask the program to go ahead and count the number of researchers for each combination of discipline and funding level if I hadn't already counted things. In this case, I've already counted things, so I'll select the radio button that says tabulated. Now, the columns I'm going to put into the analysis will be columns A through Y. So I'll put those in the columns field. Subject, I'm going to use for labels. Those will be labels for the different rows. All right, when I press OK, it'll now ask me how many dimensions I wish to extract, principal dimensions. As I said, this data would typically be needed to, we need to plot it in four dimensions if we wanted to see everything perfectly. But in this case, I'm going to ask it to reduce to the default um, dimensionality of two. I also need to indicate to the program if there are any supplemental points and in fact we're going to treat the last two rows as supplemental and the last column as supplemental. All right, go ahead press OK. And now it's going to offer me different tables and graphs. I think the uh, table selection, the default is good. I'm going to change the graph selection though and ask for a mosaic plot rather than a scree plot. When I press OK, it will then do the analysis and open an analysis window. The first thing I'd like to look at here is the mosaic plot in the upper right corner. A mosaic plot is a real nice way of looking at data in a two-way table. And by default, it's set up so that you can easily see the distribution uh, across each row. Now, the way a mosaic plot works is it basically draws a rectangle with an area proportional to the count in a particular cell of the table. And it does it in an interesting way. First, it creates a row of bars. And the height of the bars in each row will be proportional to the total amount of data in that row. So, for example, you can see that the bars in the chemistry row are pretty tall, meaning that there were quite a few uh, chemists who applied for grants. On the other hand, the bars for statistics are fairly, uh, well, they're not very tall. I guess there weren't many statisticians uh, applying for grants. Within each row, you'll see by the width of the bar, the distribution within that row across the different funding levels. So, for example, in geology, you'll see that the biggest bar is the bar corresponding to funding level C. Uh, the smallest uh, funding level A. If you examine this plot, you can actually begin to get a feeling for how things differ from one discipline to another. A better way to compare the disciplines and the point of the correspondence analysis, however, is not shown by the mosaic plot. It's shown by a correspondence map. Now on this map, the data in each one of the rows and each of the columns, those profiles, have been reduced to two principal dimensions. Now, currently, we're seeing both row and column profiles. To make this a little clearer, I think I'll right-click, go to Pane Options, and ask it not to plot the columns. Now you see just a, a plot of the rows. What it has done is it has extracted from those row profiles two principal dimensions, basically projected the points from a four-dimensional space down to a two-dimensional space. The two-dimensional space that best discriminates, if you like, amongst those scientific disciplines. Now, the way this works is if two disciplines are similar, they'll be close together 
on this plot. If they're different, they'll be far apart. In fact, the distance between points on the plot is a measure of how dissimilar uh, the disciplines are. You'll note, for example, that mathematics and math sciences and statistics are all quite close together. That means that the distribution across the funding levels for those disciplines was quite similar. On the other hand, museums, which was another one of those supplemental points, is quite far from everybody else, meaning that the distribution in that particular row is quite a bit different than in the other rows. Now, if I plot the columns instead of the rows, you can begin to get an understanding of what these two dimensions might actually represent. For example, dimension one, which is the horizontal dimension, seems to lay out the funding levels in a logical sequential sort of a fashion with level A, the most funding, far to the left, and then as you move to the right, you see level B, level C, and level D, which indicates that basically the farther you are to the left on the correspondence map, the more frequently you get high levels of funding. On the other hand, dimension two, the vertical dimension, basically discriminates between researchers who get at least some funding, A, B, C, and D, versus those that get no funding, that's E. So the lower you are on the plot, the more likely you are to get funding. The higher you are, the less likely you are to get funding. Now with that interpretation in mind, let's go back to the plot we had a moment ago, which was a plot of the rows instead of the columns. Think about museums, for example, the supplemental point on museums. Museums are toward the bottom of the plot, meaning that if you work in a museum, if you make a grant based upon what you would like to do in a museum, there's a pretty good likelihood you'll be funded. It's low uh, in dimension two. On the other hand, it's fairly far to the right, so the level of funding you'll get won't be very high. On the other hand, if you look at something like physics, uh, their chance of getting funded is sort of average. It's near that horizontal line on the plot. But when they do get funded, since they're far to the left, uh, they're likely to get a large amount of funding. This sort of interpretation um, is something that we'd like to be able to get out of a correspondence analysis if we can. One last thing to look at. Since we've reduced the dimensionality from 4 down to 2, there's going to be some loss of information. To see just how much loss of information there is, I'll double click to put the graph away and then go down and double click on the table that's titled Inertia and Chi-Square Decomposition. The most interesting column to me here is the column labeled Cumulative Percentage. This talks about the cumulative percent of the variability in that table that's been represented by the first dimension, the first two dimensions, the first three dimensions, the first four dimensions. You can see now that by plotting things in two dimensions, I've captured almost 84% of the variability. So I've lost maybe 16% of the information if you like. But that means I've captured most of it and it's made it very easy to visualize what points are similar uh, to what other ones. Now, if I wanted to capture perhaps 97% of the variability, you'll see that three principal dimensions will capture nearly 97% of the variability. 
To see that, I could go back to the Tables and Graphs button and ask, instead of a 2D correspondence map, ask for a 3D correspondence map. That puts the observations, the profile points, in three dimensions. And again, turning off the columns so that it's a little bit less confusing, I can now rotate this plot around in three dimensions and again see with respect to three dimensions, three principal dimensions, what points are similar to what other points and what points like museums are far away from everybody else.